the general formulation of this question is what's outside of it, well, what's outside of our universe. So in time and in space. I know it's a pothead question, Sean. I understand. <laughs> I apologize. Look, that's my life. My life is asking pothead questions. <laughs> okay. Some of them, the answer is, that's not the right way to think about it. Okay. But is it possible to think at all about what's outside our universe? It's absolutely legit to ask questions, but you have to be comfortable with the possibility that the answer is there's no such thing as outside our universe. That's absolutely on the table. In fact, that is the simplest, most likely to be correct answer that we know of. But it's the only thing in the universe that wouldn't have an outside. <laughs> if, yeah, if the universe is the totality of everything, it would not have an outside. That's so weird to think that there's not an outside. We, we want there to be, we want there to be sort of a creator, a creative force that led to this so, and an outside, like this is our town and then there's a bigger world and there's always a bigger world. And to Because think that, that is our world. experience. Yeah. That's the world we grew up in, right? The universe doesn't need to obey those rules. It's such a weird thing. When I was a kid, that used to keep me up at night. Like what if the universe had not existed? <laughs> right. And it, it, it feels like a lot of pressure that this is the, if this is the only universe and uh, we're here, one of the few intelligent civilizations, maybe the only one, it's the old theories that we're the center of everything. It just feels suspicious. That's why many worlds is kind of exciting to me because it like is, is humbling in all the right kinds of ways. It feels like infinity is the way this whole thing runs. There's one pitfall that I'll just mention because there's a move that is made in these theoretical edges of cosmology that I think is a little bit mistaken, which is to say, I'm going to think about the universe on the basis of imagining that I am a typical observer. I, this is called the principle of typicality or the principle of mediocrity or even the Copernican principle. Nothing special about me. I'm just typical in the universe. But then you draw some conclusions from this and what you end up realizing is you've been hilariously presumptuous because by saying I'm a typical observer in the universe, you're saying typical observers in the universe are like me. <laughs> and that is completely unjustified by anything. So I'm not telling you what the right way to do it is, but these kinds of questions that are not quite grounded in experimental verification or falsification are ones you have to be very careful about. That to me is one of the most interesting questions it, it, it's in different ways to approach it, but like what's outside of this? How did the big mess start? How do we get something from nothing? That's always the thing you're sneaking up to. When yeah. you're studying all of these questions, you're always sneaking up. That's where the black hole and the unifying, getting quantum gravity, all this kind of stuff. You're always sneaking up to that question. Um, where did all of this come from? So, yeah, and I that's think that's fair. probably an answerable question. Right? No. It doesn't have to be. So you think there's there could be a turtle at the bottom of this that's, that refuses to reveal its identity? Yes. I think that um, the specifically the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Yeah. Does not have the kind of answer that we would ordinarily attribute to why questions. Because the typical why questions are embedded in the universe. And when we answer them, we take advantage of the features of the universe that we know and love. But the universe itself, as far as we know, is not embedded in anything bigger or stronger, and therefore it can just be. <laughs>